The thing about extinction is that usually it doesn't announce itself. It creeps. A cacophony thins to a cry. A cry lows to a whisper and then silence falls, place by place, land by land. I miss green finches, cuckoos, elm trees, hedgehogs, the sounds and shapes of my childhood, my recent past. These stories are about horror, loss and shame but they are also about hope and growing up. My first tale is of the great orc, once a bountiful penguin of the north that thrived throughout the North Atlantic. Britain had breeding colonies in Orkney and St Kilda. Flightless and gentle, the orc was a torpedo in the water, but, well, awkward on land. Tragically, they were neither savvy nor suspicious enough to realise what horrors they had to contend with from us. We hunted orcs to rarity for their soft, dense down feathers, which made lovely pillows. Hunters despised them for their trust. Sometimes, they couldn't quite spare the effort required to actually kill the birds. They simply ripped out their feathers and left them to freeze. In 1840, three sailors from St Kilda caught the last of the great orcs seen in Britain. They found the lonely bird as it slumbered perched on a ledge. They thought to bring it home alive, so tied its feet together and dragged it to their bothy. But the poor creature was not to survive for long. That night, a fierce storm blew up on the island. It raged for three days and three nights, trapping the sailors together with the screaming, gurgling bird in the tiny bothy. Becoming ever more rattled and more desperate, they concluded that the orc was a witch who was purposely holding them captive by raising the storm. So they beat it to death with clubs and stones. The orc's last refuge was near Iceland, an inaccessible volcanic rock sticking up out of the sea, completely protected by cliffs, safe from man. Then the volcano erupted and the islet sank under the waves. The birds swam the few short, deadly miles to the nearby island of LD. On discovery in 1835, this last colony was 50 strong. By 1844, all the birds were dead. It was not fishermen or feather hunters who finally did for the orc, but museums, our most lauded monuments to knowledge. Museums across the world who put the prestige of an orc exhibit above the survival of a species. In a wildly enthusiastic or madly hubristic twist, depending on your point of view, the orc is now subject to scientists' ambitions to master the de-extinction of favoured species. In the orc's case, through tangling the scrapings of its DNA with the genome of razorbills. The determination of one man to reverse the arrow of history occupies the cracked kernel of my second tale. The extinction in and reintroduction to Britain of the Great Bustard. If the orc possessed a tragic aura from the start, the bustard is, by contrast, something of a clown. Nothing about these birds seems convincingly serious, from the male's sheer enormousness, towering over females and three times their weight, to migrating despite looking like an ostrich. 
But the most astonishing thing about the Great Bustard is the boys' mating dance, which is the campest, most ostentatious parade of feathers there ever was. The Bustard seems intent on turning himself entirely inside out, and then he tries to look important while drumming the ground with his feet and grunting. For those of you familiar with the male mating dance at British weddings and pubs, aspects of his routine may not seem entirely unfamiliar. Bustards were, most unfortunately for them, delicious. Most sources suggest that the last great bustard in Britain was shot in 1832. One man decided to bring the bustard back, and since 2004 he's been battling the odds to achieve his dream. David Waters has gone to every length, including deceit, adoption and multiple television appearances to establish a breeding population on the army training grounds of Salisbury Plain in Wiltshire. Initially, Waters brought chicks, then eggs, through forests of bureaucracy and no small controversy, back to the UK from a conservation scheme in the vast plains of the Trans Volga. But his success with these Russian birds was limited. A clutch of eggs was laid in 2007, but they all failed. In 2009, the first UK chick was hatched, quite a moment, but it didn't survive its first winter. Meanwhile, some of the other birds were showing an irritating urge to migrate. Water's passion was undimmed, and a breakthrough came in 2013, following a genetic study which revealed that Spanish birds were closer cousins to our extinct UK population. In 2014, chicks from Spain were brought over, grew up successfully, and went on to have chicks of their own. Success is finally within sight, but progress still requires trickery. Each spring, conservationists replace some of the real eggs with painted wooden dummies, so they can hatch and rear some chicks indoors. They do this because normally only one chick per nest survives in the wild. To prevent these chicks from imprinting on human form, Waters and his volunteers dress up as bustards, their arms disguised as the mother bird's head to feed the little ones. A clownish suit that somehow seems appropriate for these saviours, or should that be creators, of this most comical and vulnerable British bird. My third tale describes the plight of the reclusive corncrake, who still clings by its toes to a living in the northwestern fringes of the UK, but is long gone from most of England, where, as a summer migrant, it was once abundant. The corncrake's unworldly, rhythmic, cheese grater of a voice articulated summer nights in Britain's wild grasslands and hay meadows for thousands of years. Being shy and ground nesting, these birds rely on keeping hidden from view. They're so good at it that they're counted solely by the male's rasping call. When meadows were mown by hand, the flightless chicks could easily keep ahead of the scythes, running from patch to patch to field edge. Since tractors became commonplace in the 50s, this survival strategy was outbid. Increasingly vast machines bore down upon eggs and chicks alike. They were obliterated before drivers could spot them. Then, as more farmers turned to silage over haymaking, the tall grass season became impossibly short, and corncrake numbers nosedived. In the 1990s, the RSPB built up incontrovertible evidence that delaying the date of mowing and mowing from the middle of the field outwards, so the chicks always have somewhere safe to run, majorly increases breeding success. 
farmers with fields in which corncrakes are nesting, are now paid to follow these corncrake-friendly mowing methods. This strategy suggests that people have begun to think at an ecological level and to balance the desire for profit and productivity against the needs of other beings. That is, as long as the benefits are proven beyond all doubt and farmers can be financially compensated. Can we now see our inescapable entanglement with other species? Might we be, finally, ready to grow up and share this world? <laughs>